Hello, everyone. What is up? I hope you are well. It is Tim back with another episode of the New Evangelicals podcast. So if you're on YouTube watching this, hello. If you're listening through your speakers, hello to you. So on this episode, I have trip four. Now, Trip Fuller is truly a trip, and that is not an exaggeration. He wrote a book called Divine Self-Investment, an Open and Relational Constructive Christology. Okay, this interview went about two hours, and Trip is just someone that you want to listen to talk. And he is really brilliant, and he's funny, and he's witty. Um, and he's irreverent and it's great. It's great. We talk about a lot of things. All right. We talk about, um, what open theism is versus what it isn't. We talk about, um, the idea of experiencing this divine dimension that we're trying to figure out, uh, with humanity. We talk about so many things. This is definitely one where you want to be, listening because trip really moves and he knows his stuff we talk about how the four gospels don't um all agree on things and how that's okay and i will be honest towards the end when i get really fired up i curse a lot so if you, if you don't want to hear me curse then don't listen or watch this episode but i do curse and i am not going to apologize for it it's just how i talk sometimes whenever i get really fired up so i hope you seriously enjoy this episode because honestly I love this dude. He is great. He's great to talk to. And he just has great ways of expressing things that I think a lot of us who are in deconstruction are trying to put wording on. And Trip is the person uh, who, for me, did a great job of, of really putting words on so many things that we're all thinking. That being said, a couple of favors from you. If you can share this episode and if you can give us a rating on either YouTube or on podcasts, on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, that would be just a huge help. I know I say it every episode, but seriously, those ratings and written reviews help us kind of get higher in the search engine optimization. That helps us get more well-known. And I know that people out there need to hear interviews like this one with Trip. So if you can do that, that'd be a huge help. Also, don't forget, if you want to partner with us financially, you can do that for as little as a $5 donation or a $5 monthly donation. You can help us out. It helps cover our costs, helps cover the web hosting, the Zoom stuff, the Canvas stuff, all that, all of that, and more. It also helps cover some of my time. So if you want to do that, you can. I'll put the link in the show notes. I really appreciate everyone who has given financially. I also appreciate everyone who's given via um, you know, web design or graphic design or editing, all that stuff. It's a huge help help. And we truly are trying to build a community here that actually tries to push the Christian faith forward in the state and also throughout the world. So thank you for helping me out with that. All right. Without further ado, here is my interview with Trip Fuller. I hope you enjoy it. Oh, and do you prefer Dr. Fuller or Trip? Trip. I, I just wanted to ask, just wanted to ask. All right. You can call me Reverend Dr. George Hiram Fuller the third once. All right. It, it, yeah. I my mom will like it. All right. Reverend, All right. Wait, Reverend Dr. What was it? George? George Hiram Fuller the third. All right. Oh, here yeah. we go. All right. Reverend Dr. George Hiler the third. It is great to have you on the show. <laughs> How'd I do? It was close. George Hiram Fuller the third. Oh, I missed yeah. it. Yeah. And no, no, everyone has their growing edges. So <laughs> now that you've got your one mistake for this podcast over with, I'm ready to talk about how a homeless first century jew was the image of the invisible god that part's gonna be clear tim <laughs> and trip thanks for coming on i i gotta say i'm so looking forward to this conversation um you we were talking but before i started recording you know i i was homeschooled so you need to get a little extra grace for someone like myself still catching up on basic grammar and math so I appreciate all of, all of your grace ahead of time. Thank you. But you only have a one year old, so you didn't get the luxury of the COVID homeschool teacher. Exactly. Like you had a background, like you could have done yeah. better. <laughs> you know, I had a 12 year old at the beginning of lockdown. And after I realized we weren't going back, <laughs> guess what I decided we should do? What? Read Plato's Republic together. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Like there is like at least three or four days he enjoyed it. <laughs> the others, he's like, "Are we done talking about Plato yet?" I was like, "Yeah, but what is justice?" 
Well, I, I that's a you great get paid segue. to ask the same question three times in a row, Dad. I was like, yeah, but see, uh, philosophers understand that after the third time you ask the question, then you finally heard it. Or, you know, Anyway, go ahead. So but I, I, I want to clarify for our audience because, you know, up until a few weeks ago, I never even heard of you. So I heard your episode on the Bible for normal, uh, normal people. Uh, you're, you're have a PhD in uh, uh, religion and philosophy. Is that what that is? Yep. Okay. Which are two great, very clear. I feel like there's such clarity and absolutes around all about both of those topics. So, um, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> And oddly enough, like general consensus, every philosopher and every religious person agree on everything. Right. And totally. so we have nice, tight, final, secure, completely certain answers. You know, Dr. James White, I probably, I, I bet loves that. You know, I know he's a big, a big fan of absolutes. So um, listen, it's great to have you on. I, I want to start with this book. You wrote a book, Divine Self-Investment in Open and Relational Constructive Christology Studies in Open and Relational Theology. So my first question is, why are you a heretic? Can we start with that one? You know, like, well, obviously this title says it all. <laughs> yeah, the... <laughs> Um, the, the heresy bit. So I was a Baptist church planners kid in the South. Okay. And, um, and, and we were, Southern, we hence got excommunicated. My parents won an award for like the highest number of baptisms per capita, I guess, like, you know, like baptisms per people They came. And then there was like a, a gay person leading worship. And they were like, uh, it, we aren't sure this is allowed and and so that really was like a, a slippery slope into not oh. being baptized into the resurrected body of christ so the like wow so i've had i have this weird weird background okay where like i grew up with all the like evangelical piety i didn't know you could go to bed without reading the bible and praying every day right <laughs> I still don't like, right. Most of us still don't, (laughs) you know, like even when in college, when, if you were like trip, do you believe in God? I don't know. And then, but if you had said like, did you read the Bible and pray before bed? Yeah, of course. hundred percent. I'm human. Aren't I? (laughs) Right. I'm not a monster. I'm not a psychopath. (laughs) I don't know if there's anything there, but obviously the ancient Hebrew narratives that reflect on the human condition and the possibilities for community moving towards justice and beauty. Like, obviously I should read those. Uh. So, like, I, w- I-, I guess like when you ask like how I got a heretic, but because I grew up, you know, you as a pastor's kid, you only go to churches, your parents work. At. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. The, they took having a good question as something to celebrate. So mm. When I grew up, if I asked my parents questions, they would give me a book, you know, and there's like obviously a giant library around. I have a (laughs) preacher and a teacher as parents. So right, right. When I was in fifth grade, um, you know, leading up to Easter, this is before I'd met a Roman Catholic I didn't witness to. So I didn't know it was Lent, (laughs) but uh, that's what it was in preparing uh, for Easter. I read all four gospels. Um, the the last week of Jesus, like the Passion Week. Okay. Um, and and because I was Baptist, I thought obviously you chart things out when right. there's a Bible. Right. And, but this wasn't for foreign policy, so we're all good, right? right. So I charted good out point. the good four, <laughs> I charted out the four Gospels, and I'm like, one in John, Jesus doesn't cleanse the temple; he does it at the beginning of his ministry. Mm. He doesn't die on the same day. In right. Mark, it, on the cross, the only thing Jesus says is like, God, why'd you forsake me? <laughs> right. in, in the Gospel of John, Jesus is rolling deep as the eternal Logos incarnate, right? <laughs> right? And they go to arrest him. They're like, where's Jesus? And he just goes, I am. And they fall over. <laughs> Super right? so, like Avengers level attack here, you know, like it's yeah. me, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so they... <laughs> I I'm like charting this out. I'm like, he's not even the same character in these things. Mm-hmm. It doesn't happen on the same day in Matthew. There's like freaking zombies that raise <laughs> from the dead. Like, you know, so right. I, I have this lined out and I bring my parents in at night. Cause I'm very concerned. I'm like, right, mom, dad, right, right. my Bible's broken. Right. <laughs> Cause the assumption was right. They would all line up and have a perfectly seamless top yes right like the service would be beautiful and my right. mom and dad were like 
no, that's actually like, there's nothing wrong with your Bible. That's actually how the four gospels are. It's like, yeah, yeah. But don't you think Jesus died on one day and not another? There's not like more than one Jesus. They're like, yeah, yeah, but that's not what the gospels say. And so like, I kept asking questions and I'm like, just, just what happened in his last life. What you like, there's a giant religion and everything's based on him dying right raising from the dead right and they can't get when he died right right come on right right and then right. some of them are like he's freaking out he doesn't know if abba is real like mark and the other ones he's like i am the eternal god like john and everything in between there's freaking zombies no one no historian wrote about zombies and matthew right and then the others are like sidestep we aren't worried about the fact all the graves in right. israel start <laughs> popping up like like if you were asking me like what's the best evidence like you don't have to go like arguing about whether this guy was a was like a gardener right, right. like the, the, like was yeah. jesus a gardener or not resurrected no right. just say like they killed him and the zombies do you remember right. the zombies because right. they were real so anyway so right like, like walking having, dead at level here we have going on yeah right and that's just biblical see Somebody yeah. is probably getting upset right now and is triggered that I just said things that are all in the Bible. And totally. this is my thing. I was in fifth grade and I'm like, mom, dad, Bible's broken. They're like, no, that's how it is. And so their response was like, that's an excellent question. You know, just like everything that can happen, people can have multiple experiences and stories. Right. And you don't let the truth get in the way of a good story because sometimes it's what occurs in the telling that makes it true and not what happened behind it like you know like things that Let's liberal protestants for a say to each other, you, you know yes yes i, I want to stop you right here because you're doing right. great stuff and i love the train of thought but obviously i, I want to comment on what you're saying briefly and have you keep going because you're absolutely oh, yeah, correct. Yeah. you're absolutely correct a lot of people i'm pointing at myself my our listeners grew up thinking they're all unified it's all the same and when you start seeing discrepancies, the reasons that we're taught are, they don't make any sense. You know, we're like, wait, and it's almost like problematic. Like you said, it's like, oh, well, you were supposed to know that it's different days or that the zombie thing really, did it really happen? Of course it did. It's a, it's a literal everything, right? And I think what has happened during this deconstruction movement, a lot of us are in, is that as mm -hmm. we have access to people like you and these other scholars, even guys like, for me, uh, Tim Mackey, Bible Project, right? Yeah. They're kind of like just teaching the Bible on a lot of its own terms. And all of a sudden, all of my evangelical sensibilities are just like, they're wrecked. And I'm, I feel like, what's going on? So continue on with your story. I just wanted well, to insert that right there. No, I, I, I think that's really important, right? So- the, obviously from there i became a philosopher of religion do philosophical theology i'm currently working at the university of edinburgh doing a project on like whether or not reductionist materialist accounts of consciousness work and then how would you reframe like like i've gone a lot of places right oh my goodness so, which yeah. we're, we're more i just got done running a big multi-day research thing on cognitive science and neuroscience and like how you in and, and how uh, it, could you even talk about freedom like anyway it's like right, right, i right, got right. all that but it began that was the moment where i realized that my parents had a deep account like a experience of faith they trusted yes. the god they met in christ yes. and they didn't lie to me they just said that is what's there and then said and here's the beautiful thing. And I remember this moment was one of the most freeing moments when they both looked at me with just love of a son that took that cared and said, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John encountered God in Christ and had to tell the story. And the church mm. trusted the, their testimony and preserved it. Right. Now, all that's actually true. And like even my atheist New Testament scholar friends at the University of Edinburgh, they're like, I don't believe in God. If I asked, uh, like, well, actually, I, I have. It's been on the podcast where I'm like, so, but Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, would you say they have divergent testimonies to an encounter with the risen Christ that they told in narrative form as best they could? And they were like, obviously. Mm. Right? So I want, I just say that because it, it, like, even someone who doesn't believe in God, and someone who does, like my parents, right, 
it's just what the gospels are doing. Hmm. It, and if you understand what kind of literature it is, then you get to respond to it. Cause like no one gives themselves to someone, Jesus, right? If you're a disciple and live in that way, um, right. because the facts demanded it, it's much more like being seized, being grasped. Like, yes. um, when I was an undergrad and I met my wife for the first time at this social gathering and I was like, Oh, junk. <laughs> I was like, I want to talk to you right. about whatever you want to talk about. Right. right. And then right. like all of a sudden this mystery that's her is like so totally. attractive and I like want to figure it out. Yeah. But if you would but like, if we were friends and then I kind of went back to my dorm room and you're like, trip, how'd that, how'd that go? Right. And I started telling you about it. You wouldn't think, you would say something like, "All oh, trip, you're really into her. Uh, right. I'm, I'm excited for you. Like, I hope that works out. But you wouldn't also ask for a phone number because you, <laughs> you know, right. like, right. You would right. like, it does it like that kind of truth that seizes you. There's some type of existential register, which is at the, the heart of the book. Um, and the existential register is what comes out in a multiplicity of testimonies because love stories can't be told from anywhere, but your full situated in fleshed embodied contextual situation, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John come from different parts of the early church with different live questions they're wrestling with. And a lot of them are figuring out what does it mean to call Jesus Lord in the context and with different histories. Yeah. Um, and so, in a sense, those gospels are theological narratives that are testimonies to their living experience with God mediated by Jesus. And so like from that early moment, my, my parents handed me a book about the historical Jesus mm. and like, not that I'm sure I, I don't know if I really understood it. Like right. I have the book. Right. Um, <laughs> and so it's more of like a totem in a sense, mm -hmm. like that from this moment. Right. But I would just say, if you're deconstructing and the uneven surface of the gospels yes is a problem then maybe you aren't hearing the gospels as actually testimonies to the good news because no when you tell me the good news of holding your kid that's one for the first time and then right. your wife does yeah they will sound different in fact if you ask alicia and i with every birthday when we retell the stories of our kids yeah. they aren't even accurate right yeah i have readjusted how i tell stories because i know her memory is better than mine <laughs> <laughs> right, right 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 but but he, every time we tell the story the the true part is does the kid see your face light up and you go i don't know who i am without you in it right and so the gospels i think um the, when you ask about the truth, it isn't, is the surface lining up with all these things, but can the one who tells the story understand themselves apart from the God who has seized them through their encounter with Christ? Okay, so what I hear you saying is that the gospel authors are not as concerned about the, uh, let's just call it enlightenment style data and truth that we've come to know of what the word truth means. Like here's mm -hmm. the facts, here's the hours, here's the day, here's, you know, Judas, you know, here's how he died. Um, they're not that concerned about that. Unlike us or me as a Westerner who's grew up in this evangelical culture full of apologetics and why things must make full sense. And, you know, what is it? Um, evidence demands a verdict. And, you know, he's either a liar, lunatic, Ooh. whatever it is. You know, but a lot of us grew up, grew up with that sensibility, right? So when we have that framework from the beginning of like, okay, this is what the gospel is. Then we start reading and we see that's not what the gospel is. Yeah. Obviously it sends us into a total tailspin. Like, well, what is true? So yeah. is that kind of correct? Am I, am I on the right path here? Oh no, Tim, that, that is like so on point. And like when you make the joke about the liar lunatic Lord bit, um, my second book. Yeah. Um, the homebrewed Christianity guide to Jesus. Ooh, I like that. Um, uh, but like, there's a whole series and there's like Jesus, God, spirit, like, you okay. know, it goes to different doctors and they're kind of like introductions with inappropriate jokes to the conclusion scholars talk about when they talk about the doctrines. Right. So, right. 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 Um, but the Jesus one was the first one. It, I like, it's my favorite 
book I wrote, but it's also the one I got to like the first time actual other people read it. You know, like academics write stuff for six people. Right, right, right. But when you have one that like 10,000 people bought it, you're like, oh, you know, I've gone and then you have a podcast, (laughs) which is a side effect. Like if you have a podcast, you're like, I spent all this time on a book. If I'm lucky, a couple thousand people will buy it. Who knows how many finish it? Right, 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 right podcast episode 50,000 people download like why did I write the book but the, the first one was was the the homebrew Christian guide to Jesus lord liar lunatic or just freaking awesome hmm. and the whole the whole premise of the book which I mean it introduces Christology historical Jesus all that kind of stuff but the whole premise of the book is like that phrasing is just really bad for our historical moment right because it presumes that you show up to somebody where you, you, like if you were my heathen friend which having looked you up on the internet i know some people that think you're heathens <laughs> like i don't know if you were playing drums at my church i wouldn't let you do it because <laughs> your instagram i is, <laughs> but like if you i shared too much before we pre-recorded <laughs> Well, you, you can decide what you edit, Tim. But the, um, but if you if you look at Lord liar lunatic, right? Like underneath yeah. that, the assumption is that all four gospels articulate the historical Jesus said he was God, right? So yes. he's either correct, he's Lord, he's lying, right. or he's crazy, right? And if you read it, you're just like, that's actually like no New Testament scholar really thinks that. And in my head, I always tell myself. Hmm. If N.T. Wright and Marcus Borg agree, it probably is true. Huh. And they would all agree. Yeah. They would both agree. The moral Jesus, enemies, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, but they had the same dissertation advisor. They're good friends. It, so, like, right. if you think of, like, conservative, honored, biblical scholar, more progressive one, they both agree. Like, Jesus didn't walk around going, man, I'm the second person in the Trinity. You best, you best recognize this junk. Right. Tim Mackey actually says that he goes, he didn't, he says it. Tim Mackey's point in his podcast is that Jesus says it in his own Hebrew way. That is like not related to like how we would think of it, you know, and that has helped me kind of, cause I thought about the mm-hmm. same exact stuff. So like, yeah, he's not blatantly saying I am alpha and omega. I am G, you know, it's like, it's not clear like that, but then you feel like a heretic for questioning that. Cause you're taught, if you if you rethink the Trinity, you're like in full heretic land, so you can't rethink it. Well, the great thing about the Trinity being so definitional is that no one in the New Testament believed in it, so you're safe. <laughs> All right, okay, good. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, right. right. Like, and as someone who, uh, well, we can decide if I believe in the Trinity or not. I I think I do. I thought I spent a lot of time articulating it. <laughs> Um, I, right. I, and I say like, I think I mean what Gregory of Nyssa means. Who's like the one that anyway, like, like, but that doesn't mean there are plenty of people that love the Trinity. They're like trip. You don't, you don't believe it. And I'm like, right. oh, I'm fine with that. But, um, hmm. the, I just say like, if you just look at the new Testament and think these documents originated somewhere, Paul doesn't even say almost anything about what jesus ever said or did the only thing he reports in corinthians is about the lord's supper basically Mm. and then he gets crucified and raised um Mm. and then he equates a christophany the experience like the road to damascus experience or whatever as an encounter with the resurrected christ which if you just read the gospels that doesn't count like uh Mm. that resurrected christ in the gospels freaking eats fish right i mean he also goes through walls so you can (laughs) explain that one to me (laughs) but you know what i mean like so Mm, the uh, yeah i see the the gospels Mm. and the new testament letters if you just if if you were like a good literalist that recognized different people wrote them yeah right then you would just go there's like a like a giant bucket of available options in the new Testament. Mm. And, uh, and like Mark doesn't care who is Jesus's parents were. In fact, when his family shows up, he goes, I don't even want you to let them in the house. In fact, my family are the ones that know and do the will of God. Right. In John, Jesus is on the cross where John and Mark 
and Paul, no one knows about a virgin conception. Um, but on in Gospel of John, Jesus is on the cross and is making sure his disciple takes care of his mother Mary. Hmm. But there's no virgin conception in the gospel. In okay, Luke, that down. in Matthew and Luke, uh, in John, you don't need a virgin conception if you're the eternal logos made flesh. But like you can't level up. In the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was with God, right? Like there's no level up from that. Hmm. That's like, so like if you took him in historical order, Mark, right? the the identification of Jesus as son happens at baptism, which is the beginning of the gospel of Mark. Hmm. In Matthew and Luke, which are written after that, right? um, it's conception. Not in the same city, because they they don't line up right. historically and such. But Matthew has Jesus as a new Moses, so it follows Moses' lineage, right? So he has to escape Herod, Herod and goes to Egypt. Oh, who comes wow. out of Egypt? Wow. Moses. And what is Matthew built around? Five discourses by Jesus. Well, who else gave five discourses that came out of Egypt escaping for their life? Moses? Convenient. <laughs> would this gospel right. be a jewish one yeah so jewish jesus and the gospel of matthew says you can't even change a vowel signal on any of the parts of torah now luke hmm. who also has the virgin conception um tells a different genealogy like in matthew it goes back to abraham mm-hmm. in luke it goes back to adam why because Jesus is the second Adam, a new right. humanity, not right. a new Moses. And then, anyway, right, exactly. Like, right. There's Very so many details. There, yeah. but so, the, huh. like, but here's the beautiful thing all four of those gospels get canonized. So, if you have mm. this like deep desire and identity that comes out of Judaism, you have a way of articulating how Jesus is the Christ, is the new Moses and Matthew. If you are a, like a Greek philosopher, obsessed with the logos the principle of reason and possibility that's structured in existence then john is your gospel if you are a new gentile convert and then this homeless first century jew and yet in his faithfulness to the one he calls abba and the kingdom brings in through his uh way of being an invitation in the world Mm. an alternative kingdom an alternative vision of power then Luke could be your gospel. This is the one that says, woe to, right? Right. The rich. Like it's right. the one where Mary says, my son's the one that throws people from their, 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 uh, uh from the, the, the kingly places, the, the thrones and puts them down. The one that fills up the valleys hmm. of oppression and puts a level field, like quoting Isaiah, right? Right. And, and Mark, um, is so focused on this apocalyptic judgment of God in the face of the the uh, destruction of the temple when it right. was composed. Right? Right. Seven. So I say all that just to go like the New Testament's full of a multiplicity of affirmations. Yeah. Just yeah. acknowledge them because here's the thing, and here's why I find this fascinating. I'd be interested just in thinking about your audience, what you think. I feel like it's life-giving in a time where so many people are renegotiating their relationship to scripture, Mm -hmm. to different beliefs. Mm -hmm. So then what does it even mean to be a Christian to go, the church canonized multiple voices that don't agree on the surface, but agree on the embodied engagement of faith. So they don't agree on the details on lots of things. They have different focuses and such, but what they what do they do agree? That they, they've encountered God mediated by Jesus and can't tell the story of their life and what a beautiful life looks like seeking after justice in life without telling the story of Jesus. Yeah. And if that means that you have this beautiful confidence like John and are like, yeah, basically all the goodness that ever came in the world is through the Logos, which obviously is in the homeless first century Jew on this planet, <laughs> then great. But what if you're like more like Mark and you're like, there was this one guy who when he began his mission was baptized and he heard no one else, 
that this is my son. Right. right. And he was faithful all the way to the end, but died not knowing hmm. if his father cared and said, why my God, not father, have you forsaken me? Hmm. And what if that's all you can muster and yet you decide to show up and live in the way of Jesus? Can't we have all of them in the church because they're all in our Bible? Okay. That's, that, that's kind of like the thing I love about Christology yes. is that if you just take the Bible more seriously, so many people who are asking questions find out we canonized an ally rather than projecting on their stories and the text, yes. the conclusions of our tradition, a version of the Trinity or a version of atonement or whatever. Right. Those are beautiful conversations, yes. but they aren't gateways that decide if you're in and out. Yes. Okay. Woo, trip. Yes. Um, you put it in such beautiful wording, but the, the way I simplify that is, is, is there not enough seats at the table? Like, is there not room at the table for these perspectives to sit and listen and talk and dialogue because we need them, right? You need the Johns, you need the Marks, you need those people because they help you flesh out an infinite concept of a, of a divine being who mm -hmm. also like somehow impacted earth via a, some kind of human way that we're wrestling through and also like in the cosmos, right? So you're absolutely spot on because so many of my conversations and my DMs, you know, on podcasts, talking to people, doing these deconstruction groups, most people I found in my circles they want to keep their faith. That's why they're deconstructing. You know, they didn't ask for it. They just have questions and they're wondering, is the Christian faith big enough for social justice? Is it big enough to handle? Is there a God who wants to redeem things on a systemic and an individual level? And yeah. unfortunately, a lot of us are being told by, I call them gatekeepers, by evangelical gatekeepers that no, that, that's Marxism, that's communism, that's a false gospel. And we feel so alone sometimes because we're reading the Bible in a very yeah. non-academic surface level, but we're still reading it and we're like, but it's very clear, you know, like Jesus is for the oppressed and poor. Empire is a problem in, in the Bible. So yeah. I think you're really speaking the language here. Absolutely. Do you, do you think that, um, uh, so you know how like in the last year, if you were just checking like the Google trends, deconstruction blew up again. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. you know, it's like, I'm not like that there. And I think a lot of it's correlated. Um, and I have a friend that's working on the data on this, who does, uh, he's a sociologist of religion, but okay, we were, we were talking the other day, but he said that the, you know, the first big wave of deconstruction, which was when the emerging church kind of yeah, yeah. kicked off, right? Brian uh, McLaren, for, those guys. Yeah. For yeah. us old millennials, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, was there. Love wins, yeah. does it not? <laughs> yeah. When you, the, uh, yeah, but love wins. I, w when that book came out, I was, uh, Rob sent me the, uh, hit the first draft of it and was like what do you think and i sent him a letter back i was like you know some of your other books are edgy this is basically like fourth century like this mm. is like basic Christ early church the theology and he was like mm. really and then i just sent him like j large chunks of gregory of nyssa and origin and, and anyway all like because in the early right. church like half the theologians we still read are universalists and they got pissed at people that weren't right. Can, so can I just say they, one thing about that quickly? I'm sorry to cut you off. I know. No, no, go for I, it. I don't mean to interrupt you. It's your show. I know, but I like having my guests talk. Um, I just finished the book and don't, I don't know how you feel about him, but heaven and hell by Bart Ehrman. Okay. And he, I'm he, friends with Bart. He does a so. great job. I read for the first time. And I'm like, Oh my God, these early church fathers, the, yeah. the views of the afterlife are way more diverse and universal or annihilationist than we ever, I ever was ever taught. So I agree with you. I just want to say, yes, I totally, I totally track. My favorite of, uh, this is a detour. So you have to remember what we were answering before I'm taking I get notes. done with this. I got okay. Notes. So, you know, the passage now I remember I, I was a Southern Baptist preacher's kid. Um, mm. When you do Philippians two, mm. the, christology him in that right let the same mind be in you that was in christ jesus who did not count equality with god something to be grasped but humbled himself taking the form of the servant even mm. right to the cross right right and then it, you're like oh that's beautiful who right. doesn't love a kenosis right 
Um, but then the end is, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God, the Father. Now, I heard that, I, and I grew up in a context where we were all embarrassed about the second half. Right, right, right. Right, Same. because it sounds like God is awesome, and then Jesus is like, I am just going to be faithful to God's love, even if I die. Right. And you know the reason? Because my dad's going to make you bow to my shit. Right. 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 Like it's <laughs> and, coming. The wrath is coming. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Gregory of Nyssa, the guy who invented the logic philosophically for how the Trinity works. So mm. just to signal to you that might call Tim a heretic if he doesn't believe in the Trinity, <laughs> the guy that worked out mutual participation under Neoplatonic terms. Mm. Um, um, and if you don't know what that means, it's just me signaling, like, it's a real big deal if you're a theologian. Um, <laughs> Gregory of Nyssa it preached on this text. Mm. You know what his conclusion for this text was? Can you guess what a Christian universalist would preach on this text? Lay it out, man. I want to hear. He said, well, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and tongue confess. He goes, now, since this is the God of love who doesn't coerce all the way to death on a cross, right? Okay. Sounds so if you get Calvinism, if, right? right like if you go all the way to the cross without pulling out your divine power, mm. then what you've said is mm, right, love right, right. isn't possible if I coerce you. Yes. Right. And we know this as a parent, you succeed totally. when you instill in your kid love for learning rather than slapping them. So they pay attention to their teacher. You right. failed if you have to coerce. Right. 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 So Gregor of Nyssa makes this point. He goes, successful loving parenting is when the character of the father, Abba, he knows what he's signaling, is instilled in the child all of us children of God, image bearers, mm. so that the image is then reflected and mirrored. And in that reciprocity, beauty grows. Mm. And so when Jesus is faithful all the way to the cross, he then is opening a space where the fidelity of God mirrors the fidelity of Jesus so that eventually the ever persistent infinite love of God pursues us. Just hmm. like Jesus was faithful to the cross. Right. Until every person comes to know, here's his line, that the most true thing about you is the identity given in your creation. Hmm. That identity in the church is echoed in your baptism, that you are the beloved of God. And then in your life, in this life and in the next, like Gregor, no one thinks like after you die, you have to have accepted Jesus to go to heaven. That's not, was invented after capitalism, but we can make an aside on that. No, in that um, down. <laughs> yeah, but. <laughs> Shots um, fired, dude. So Gregory of Nyssa goes like, the infinite God of love has decided I will force no one to love me, but I will show up every moment loving them until what? They're they bow the mm. knee. Mm. And when you bow the knee, you aren't going. I got beat and bent over. You're bowing the knee in a move of betrothal. That's mm. what Gregory of Nietzsche preached. So Gregory of Nietzsche, a guy that invented the logic of the Trinity and how all three persons work out, said, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he goes, it's not because it's about Jesus. It's because it's about the nature of infinite, eternal, non-coercive love. Because wow. it's not that you, the name of Jesus is confessed because Jesus is amazing and everyone needs to not say liar or lunatic. It's because at the name of Jesus, every tongue confesses, what? For the glory of God. And then he says, who is this God? God is love. Boom in sermon right and he just like he hears that text and i read it for the first time when i was an undergrad and i was yeah. like what the w like right, right. i texted right. my parent you like i was talking to my dad when i went home um after i read that and i was like dad have you ever read this junk <laughs> and like and he read it and then the next time like we got back together after it he was like 
I think he's right. Wow. No one told me about this. Right. Like, you know, he went to it, it, like he went to a Baptist seminary and all that kind of stuff. He's like, no one told me about this. Like, what would it mean if Jesus' life, what he said and did and endured hmm. in his life, is reflecting the very nature and heart of God? Hmm. And then how would that God win? Right. By being by that love being infinitely faithful and invested in the person wherever they are calling them to be all they can be which mm. is why the my book's called divine self investment is yes it, yes it came from that kind of like uh insight that even these passages like bow the knee were in the early church were like well, given we know God's way too loving to be a j- like a like a jackass, mm. <laughs> like <laughs> since coercion is morally de- decrepit to God, like uh. how would you get to people bowing the knee? It would be from the persistent, ever faithful, invested love of of the infinite Abba. Anyway. So, well, you know that you just made a lot of Calvinists angry because the wrath of God is coming and you either are yeah, chosen I, or you're not. So I'd rather be an atheist than a Calvinist. <laughs> that is my intro to this episode right there. Well, but, I, I, mean, up, I say that because I grew up in that worldview and I lost it uh, I don't know, four or five years ago. Thanks to actually Leighton Flower, Sociology 101. Uh, yeah. he, he's really aggressive and, and kind of dismantling Calvinism. And that was for me, the beginning of me having to rethink a lot of things, because I got to a point where I thought like, how can God be love and also predestining the majority of the world for hell to burn forever? It doesn't make Isn't any that, sense. Is, okay, Tim. Okay. So my, like, I spent time as a Calvinist and I was good at it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, you, do you know, Derek Webb? Yeah, I know Derek. Okay, so I know the whole story. Yeah. So, like, I was like in guild members, and we would like exchange books on how to be a cool Calvinist, (laughs) you know? Yeah. And it was real important for us to not be hyper Calvinist. Oh, right. Okay. (laughs) Anyway, so like, I (laughs) yeah. And when I left Calvinism behind, (laughs) but because there's this whole. There's a kind of Calvinism. Maybe we don't need to take a derail on it, but there's a kind of Calvinism that has reworked the nature of providence and sovereignty to mute what is the ugly parts of something like double predestination, where God elects and yes. like acknowledges the fact God didn't. Right, right, um, right. And and that if, at some point that just became problematic. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think a lot of people, you know, they're deconstructing that becomes problematic when you meet people in another religion or no religion that are better humans than you. hundred percent. Right. Then you're like, you are an image bearer, which is just a gift for being human. Right. And you're doing a better job. Right. Than me. (laughs) Right. Which I'm a mediocre human, kind of nerdy. Um, I feel like I'm in the top half of being a parent. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like, on a good day. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, like I'm not optimistic about a lot of things about me. I feel like I'm an excellent like acquaintance friend. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but the uh right the, like I have my one of my best friends in high school was like very devout Jew and gay. Okay. And that was like when so much of my Southern Baptist stuff broke totally. because I was like He's a dude that likes dudes. He also is into Yahweh, but right. in a very different way, you know, like, and, and yeah. he just lectured me on not, not really keeping the Sabbath, which is a 10 commandment. I shouldn't be able to get out of. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> Great point. Yes. You know, and, and he was just like, Convenient. Yeah, but he was just like, but tri- Jesus was Jewish. And even the liberal Jews that like me, a gay Jew think what you're saying about the Sabbath doesn't work. I mean, you may have switched today, but like, I don't even know any that follow your weird rules, namely that you do whatever you want. As long as you show up at church, even if you were at a party until three in the morning, as long as you were there, somehow that's called keeping the Sabbath. Like I don't, (laughs) my mind it's melting. (laughs) 
Yeah. I was like, <laughs> okay, I agree, but I'm also not a fundamentalist. Right. So <laughs> I'm not a literalist, you know, like it's yeah. not literal the Sabbath, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's more of a suggestion. Right. <laughs> it's a suggestion. And he was like, and you go to restaurants on the Sabbath? And I was like, yeah. He's like, but that's supporting an industry that works on the Sabbath. And the mm -hmm. Sabbath was a gift we were given when we left slavery in Egypt. Wow. Are you interested in having practices that help support the exploitation of the working poor when you're going to worship? And I was like, Ben, I don't understand what you just said. <laughs> But I feel like I'm going to feel mm. guilty after I reflect on, you know, like. Also, you're like, a Marxist. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> and he right. was like, no, he's like, he's like, well, Marx was right. Like a Jew. Right. So, it's a very like. Oh, you got but, me. But it was funny. Right. Like, I just remember that. But So like when you yeah. have that moment. Right. Yeah. And then you go like they have the Imago Dei. Like before the foundations of the earth hmm. apparently the god who was love who's gonna choose the oppressed people of israel followed by i don't have a place to lay my head hmm. itinerant preacher who's crucified by the empire is like yeah but still um <laughs> I have my elect and the unelect. Right, right. And the great thing is, you all suck. Right. So it's not personal. Right. And if uh, me I say too. one, I'm also depraved. It wasn't for the grace given to me. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So it's not personal, Tim. Right. Don't like, you, there's nothing good about the fact you right. aren't worms for eternity. Right. Uh, like, once I realized how, like, how much the underneath that, the biggest problem wasn't. The eternal choice bit of God part, uh, like from eternity, God, blah, blah, blah. Like so often that's interpreted by like God deciding where you go. Right. Um, if you pay attention to the text, and this is common, I, I again, like this is one of those, the conservative actual biblical scholars and progressive ones agree, even though I'm much more progressive. So like, but you can go check in fact it. N.T. Wright agrees with me. He's right. been on the podcast like eight times. Go listen to him. That when God, uh, before the foundations of the earth, right? Right. That whole line Force. is connected not to deciding the locations for us on the afterlife, but for deciding God's location in history. That God has chosen the underside, elected, right? The oppressed people of Israel. Hmm. Pharaoh, let my people go. God has chosen us in exile. Bring us out. God has chosen us in bound to send personal and systemic. And said, here's an invitation to liberation. Hmm. Right? Like Romans 5 to 8 and is a description how law is problematic for flourishing. And that grace creates the conditions for flourishing apart from conscription into a description of the ideal uh, existence, right? Wow. So grace is an invitation to being human in a new way, yeah. but it begins by recognizing that you always already are the object of God's divine love. And so like, as a parent, like you're just starting, like, yes, I'm working on this book right now of the, uh, I, I call them the, 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 the fuller aphorisms. Cause my last name's fuller, but nice. I picked them up from my parents, hmm. Alicia and I, we've talked about them and polished them. Uh, and then we like slowly release them to our kids when they get older, like hmm. you want you get the next fuller <laughs> aphorism, right? Like, and um, we're still inventing them as we go. Nice. Don't tell them that though. <laughs> well, I don't know if Elgin listens to your podcast. <laughs> In my, I've told him there are 12 of them because there are 12 disciples. I don't, I've only got five so far. Okay. All right. Because he's, tw he just turned 13. So, like, and in a couple of weeks, I have to give him the next one. And we haven't decided which one it is, but the, but the first one is the most true thing about you 
is your God's beloved. Mm. The most true thing. And, and I think that is uh, like, I mean, I think that's true in profound ways, right? Like, mm. what does it mean to be an image bearer of God? And then what does it mean to be given the gift of life? And it's one of those truths that if you recognize it about yourself, and if you want to decide about how this works for in psychology and social psych, I'm more than happy to give it. But like, if you believe your identity is treasured and affirmed and not up for grabs, mm. the best gift you can give an infant is holding it and looking in its eyes. Mm. So who are the best ministers at any church? The nursery workers. Huh. That is, and it's true. And uh, if you had me as your minister, you'd notice that we spend more money on nursery workers mm. uh, to give them a safe space. And so that there's one nursery worker for every two infants. Wow. Because there's someone always holding them in their lap. Why? And I mean, there, there's like large science, study, but, but right, right, like right. that the idea of an other, not your family, holding you as a child with eyes of affirmation. Hmm. creates a context of trust that will shape your entire life. Like it actually shapes the way your brain develops. Wow. So what if the most true thing about you is your God's beloved, that the very reservoir of all being hmm. knows your name, knows your face and cares. Right. And no one else can say less than that. If they say you're not good enough, you don't matter. You're, you're too ugly, too fat, too skinny, whatever, like whatever judgment they're lying why? Because the source of all existence says you are my beloved. Like if you instill that, like if you recognize that, which by the way, as all Protestants, this is literally what Martin Luther said the gospel was, was trusting what God said about you is true when others lie, even yourself. Like mm. if, if you instill that, then you ask completely different questions after it. Right. And so much of our deconstruction and our fears yeah. come from wanting to know if you're good enough, if you believe the right things, if you right. do the right things, all of those are activities. And this is true in faith and in parenting and in a job. Hmm. Do you, is your, perf what you say and do determinative of your status? Right. And the gospel is Jesus doesn't give a fuck. Like, mm. it's not that God doesn't care about the actual character you live out. God just knows. And, and the gospel is an affirmation where if you are responding to the world, mm. where your evaluation, your valuation of yourself is up for grabs, we suck. Mm. Now, there, here's a basic example. When, uh, when you first meet someone and fall in love, there's like all this weird awkwardness because you're sitting there going like, do I tell this story? Right. I'm vulnerable about this. Like there's right. this whole right. like performance, right? How like much of, do I let this person know about me? Like how much yeah. right now? At, at but, what time? But if you had a good accountability partner, you practice. Of course, of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it's a, like you have that whole that's thing, great. but that's like really different. Yeah. When you have a bad day in that context where you're still negotiating, if you're if all of you is showing up, right? Then after you've been in a committed relationship or you have a deep friendship, like one of my best friends, Matt, we've been friends since we were seven. Hmm. Or right. Chess, like when I moved in Raleigh, we met. And we've been friends since then. And right. like, we plan weird ways to hang out. Like, right, still, right. like if he and I, on our worst days, we talk to each other, right? Right. right. That's different than we were on a bus one time and hung out and then slowly became friends. And But the difference is you have permission to be fully yourself. Right. But once you're fully yourself, you can show up as a friend, as a yes. lover, as a partner, as a parent in different ways. Yes. But what is the heart of the gospel? 
God knows your name, knows your face, and cares. You are God's beloved. If you trust that, all sorts of things open up. Right. But the moment we become prescriptive about you have to believe this, act this way, and this is true on left and right, mm -hmm. then your identity is under threat. It's the, the demand creates a deficiency. Hmm. Again, we already echoed Romans five through eight, but what does he say? It's like the law, like the prescription right. creates a desire to break right. it. And this is right. another way of saying that, like the demand creates a deficiency and now you have to fill it in. But right. if the most true thing about you is you're God's beloved, hmm. then the question is, not like what you have to do, but what do you get to do? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because get to do, like when you like think of like that perfect gift and it's not even birthday, Mother's Day, right. anniversary. Right, yeah, yeah. But you're like, I'm going to get it. I'm going to drop it. That's right. And then she's going to pick it up and go, oh, jump. Or like, you know, your kids had a hard time, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, I'm going to get off work. I'm going to go pick them up from school. And if you have my kid, you're going to go to Subway. <laughs> Why? I don't know who chooses that. I have a kid that does. Okay. And he's like, and I took him thing. last Friday and he goes, dad, would you pick me up to go to Subway again? Because I want to talk to you. That's what you just told me right before we got on. I was like, yeah, but am I saying yes? Because Subway is good. <laughs> no, their bread's not Hopefully even Hopefully not. <laughs> Is the bread's not bread. It has so much sugar in it. Ireland's like, it doesn't count as bread. But what am I saying yes to? Is it right, like right. this adolescent kid that moved to a new country that's uncomfortable at everything? It's like, right. I want to talk to my dad without the siblings and mom around. Right. So I'm going to show up and I'm going to eat a freaking <laughs> right. sub that technically has vegetables on it. I don't know <laughs> if, count, if you're counting calories. And because he knows like what? Like that like right. dad showing up for this so that's to me is underneath so much of the deconstruction stuff is that a lot of times we deconstruct things and then use the terms of shitty christianity to yes. reconstruct right can right, we right. prove it can we determine it can we blah, 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 blah. yes what if the gospel just says i'm not interested in that here's the question can you believe that God knows your name, knows your face and cares? Right. What if God has to at least be as loving as Jesus? Right. Right. And anything less than that sucks and should be heresy. Yes. Yes. That, that I think is like one of the most freeing things. And, and I get that some deacon people in deconstruction are wrestling with the God thing or all that kind of stuff. I'll just say, like, as someone that professionally teaches at a prestigious school, the <laughs> philosophy of religion class, right? like, every year that I reteach all the proofs for God's existence and arguments against it in the battle, like, no one has ever changed their mind because mm -hmm. I have a very compelling, internally consistent argument <laughs> for or against God. Right, right, right. But you know what they do do? When they hear one that might work hmm. and they have religious baggage, like I responded an email before we got on this, where they said, Trip, I haven't gone to church in three years. Mm -hmm. Um, I took the, I went to do my master's at the University of Edinburgh in religion, science, philosophy, which is one of our master's programs. And they're in the class I'm teaching currently. Um, because I have all this religious baggage, but I have the hunch that things have to be bigger than mm -hmm. what I'm left with. Right. But I can't trust the people mm. who blessed me, right, in saying, like, there's something more, but also cursed me by going, yeah, yeah. And this individual is trans mm. and said like you can't be you you're lying blah blah, blah. Right. just insert right. all that shit totally and um and then she said i know you never talked about this but i googled you 
<laughs> and I listened to some of your podcasts. I watched the movie you made. I made a movie called The Road to Edmund, which is about like conservative religious people processing the LGBTQ issue. Yeah. But it's, it's a buddy a road trip comedy. Okay. Um, with very inappropriate jokes. Like I roll a joint in it made out of the Bible. So like oh my God, I'm not advocating. <laughs> It's on Amazon Prime. You can stream it. But so <laughs> I just sent they, you that one out. <laughs> no, 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 I want them to go watch it as long as they they can say horrible things about me as long as they leave five stars. But done. The yeah, but the uh, um, but what they said was, uh, we went through this whole thing, and I never really figured out where you came from until I googled you. I started looking on the stuff, and I want to know if my intuitions are true mm. right so this is like rural georgia trans individual right, right. hadn't gone to church in three years right. they emailed me and said something like uh this is said are you saying that it's plausible that there's an ultimate reality mm. if you're aware of all the science and the philosophy stuff and while it, you can't like force it on someone because it has to be true, you can lean into it mm. like a really good first date uh -huh. and then get caught up in it. Wow. And I was like, yeah. And I, and I, and I feel like if you just went back to the gospels and looked at how people encountered Jesus, that's all Jesus wanted, right? Like so many people came up to him and said, like, is the, the story you're telling so good? Right. And then some of them, he goes, yeah, yes. Yeah, so all you have, give it to the poor and come follow me. And then they're like, whoa, actually I'm really comfortable with all my prestige privilege and <laughs> you right, know, that kind of thing. Right, 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 right. And then, and then others said, yes. And, uh, I think because of, like you said earlier, how the enlightenment shaped what we mean by truth. Right. That then we think they're like secret barriers. Yeah. And so this past week I, I ran this research seminar and um, uh, well, I'm imagining they probably don't want me to name them, but if you Google a lot, you'll find out. But like two okay. of the most famous neuroscientists in the world, they're very committed atheists. Mm. Like, uh, but it, anyway, we were in this seminar and one of the, the uh, kind of sessions, we talked mm -hmm. about the plausibility of thinking about religion. And one of them said, I feel impotent to talk about value as a scientist. Mm. I feel like a kind of amputation mm. under science to describe my experience of value and beauty and wow. goodness wow. Yeah. and awe. Like, right. not that we don't all have it as scientists, but right. on the terms of what science does, we can't right. actually talk about this and he goes, well, I would never want to use the word religion mm. because I was a Catholic. And, and I don't, this is why I didn't want to say a name. Like, cause this is like, he said, I was a Catholic altar boy at a congregation that had very serious infringements. Mm. If you want to read into that, what you want. Like, so I would never use the word God. Mm. But if you asked me if the mystery, my naive self had, when we beheld the Eucharist mm. and he pulled his hands up. Wow. If that, if that moment wasn't a true one, mm. then I don't think we've described reality and science doesn't know how to talk about wow. the beholding right Nick, He gives this talk and he's trying to say like, Religious traditions, the institutions have all this ugliness stuff, but in yet there's a beholding, right? And he gives his talk and then, and he goes, but Tripp, you're, you know, you're in this and a minister. What do you think? And I right. said, my favorite rabbi said, behold the lilies of the field. Mm. And he also said, 
you cannot live by bread alone. Hmm. Underneath that is a statement that not that there aren't wonderfully important, intrinsic, and if we want to survive in our ecological crisis, essential things to learn about how <laughs> right. lilies and all the other plants work. Yes, right. And we it need that. doesn't mean we should not figure out how to give food to the 20,000 people that died of malnutrition, why 600 people in the United States made an extra trillion dollars than expected in lockdown because capitalism sucks ass. Yeah, It yeah. doesn't mean we shouldn't address the feeding people. Right. It just means that underneath this, all the justice stuff Jesus obviously cares about and the God of Israel does. Right. But underneath that is the, the beholding and you can't live on yes. our invitations to a depth dimension yeah. that not just Judaism or Christianity or Islam, but all the religious traditions are invitations to steward us in living in response to that mystery, right? And so I've gone back and forth with this very famous scientist in five emails in the last three days. Wow. And, um, and, and he's like conflicted and like, can I talk to a liberal Jesuit in my town? <laughs> Right. Like this is the, and, and I don't mean it as like a, oh, this is weird intellectual witnessing. I only mean it in the sense of there are people deconstructing that think caring about science or philosophy or whatever means you have to get rid of all this stuff. Yes. I'm saying the actual dimension we're in that congregation where people were homophobic backwards and stupid. Yeah. Yep. You encountered a living reality that as Christians, we thematize that reality as Christ. Right, the cosmic, whatever way you whatever. want to do it. Right, right, right. That dimension that you plugged into and go, oh, junk. I can forgive my enemy, right, or I can love myself apart from shame. Whatever that is, like wherever that battery of beauty was, I'm saying that there are people who never had that religious tradition and have had experiences of that battery that yeah, depth yeah. dimension right who are asking like can we do it without the baggage of right. shitty religion and then shitty secularism right on the terms of flat right. modernity truth totally and so, so well said. if you deconstruct deconstruct the shit but know that there are people who as someone who is in one of the most secular places in europe hmm. who teaches the philosophy of religion class for four different master's degrees, <laughs> know that when they take this class, whether they're in linguistics or in the science field or religious field or philosophy, there's so many of them that never thought about believing in God. The moment they start talking about religion without the baggage of a particular institution in place, go, so when I had this experience or I had this hunch or I had this odd, this mystery or I had this conflict or I asked this question around a campfire with friends, all of a sudden they were like, I'm religious or spiritual again, whatever the hell that means. So that depth dimension, let's affirm it and then say, as Christians-ish people right. or Jesus-ish people, how does Jesus steward that mystery? And I guarantee you, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Jesus doesn't steward it by asking yes or no truth questions. In fact, when he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, he's inviting you to a community of practice. Mm. Like, he's not asking you to assent to things. Like that, a mental ascension or something. Yeah. That's beautiful, right? Like, anyway. I, well, can I, okay, can we pause for one sec again? Because I know like, you should because. Because I feel like I'm in the Doctor Strange multiverse right now, okay? I oh. feel like you've sucked me in. And I'm like, wow, oh, these realities and what you just said, I, I can only imagine our, my listeners, if my head is spinning in a good way, this is all positive because you're speaking in a way that I think a lot of us, um, um, let me think of a good way to say it. Well, did I, did I lose you? Oh no. Oh no. Here. Hey, you there? I'm good. Cool. Yeah. I lost it for a second. Sorry. Um, but you're saying a lot that people need to, need to digest. And I think it's really good because what I, I'm going to really boil it down. What I hear you saying is that you can experience the mystery of the divine in some way outside of the labels that we give institutional Christianity and how we've come to know 
the evangelical tradition. And that for a lot of people who are deconstructing, I think is very helpful because we're a lot of people I've talked to are so scared of going to hell. I hate to say it, but we're, we're afraid like if, yeah. if, we, if we lose it, we're going to burn forever. And I think what you're saying in so many, in such an, an eloquent, very academic way is like, okay, people who don't, don't even believe in the institution of quote unquote God are, are also experiencing these moments where you go, okay, something is deeper. There's another reality here that's happening. That's kind of poking through that I don't have words for, but there's some kind of experience happening. Am I kind of summing up in some way, shape or form what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. In and you know the fascinating thing is in you know there's there's only a few studies that keep asking large numbers of americans about the same questions over time but All right. if it, of the ones that ask religious questions the the two main studies uh if you track the number of people who answer yes to there are like three different ways they ask a question for a static religious experience if you were doing right. psychology of religion um the as the number of people in the united states have said what religion are you none mm -hmm. the number of people who then if you ask uh experience of transcendence or spiritual all that kind of stuff has grown mm. right so uh underneath that i think is that for a lot of actually we're probably like in the west the first culture of human history where the overwhelming majority of people you're around don't all share the same mythopoetic structure mm. of religion religious structure mm. and um i know that sounds nerdy also, for religious scholars, myth isn't a derogatory term. It's an affirmation. <laughs> mm. It's kind of like, you know how if a philosopher says that's interesting, it's an affirmation. If your friend, you tell a story and you say that's interesting, that's <laughs> yeah. like, I have nothing to say. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. I failed. So, like, myth is like an affirmation. You're like, myth. Right. <laughs> Mythopoetic structure. Like, imagine... Um, uh, whatever the most old cathedral you've ever been in mm, mm -hmm, right mm. so you go into this cathedral um being in scotland now we have a couple really old ones yeah. and i love going in them They're you beautiful. go in a, what happens uh a couple weeks ago we went to um a cathedral that goes back well the location not the cathedral itself has been expanded and stuff over time but you know the it was a place of worship before Jesus, right? Wow. And then over time, the same space has been developed, right? And, and it, it's gotten bigger. But like when you go in, there are layers of it, of the, the cathedral. And then the first half are these stained glass windows that are, you know, you know, four times the age of America, right. which right. is someone that, spent a lot of time in california if it was from the 70s it was right old, right right so totally like you go in but if you go in this cathedral it's this beautiful architecture it's the center of the city mm. right for most of christendom yep. the hot best architecture everything's in the cathedral this is where uh 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 um isaac the bruce or king bruce but the king bruce whatever his name his where he's buried right um but it's just the the oldest part of the cathedral you come in and there's kind of like four stages where it gets bigger because more people are there and there's these uh stained glass windows mm. i love it you go look at my instagram i spent way too much time taking pictures trying to like filter them so you could see it <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah right so uh <sighs> oh, that's all because i have been working on a book where i use this illustration so you can tell me if this sucks or not all right i'll let um, you know but so like for most of us, we were born in a world where there's one cathedral. And actually right. in most of Christendom, everybody went to the same cathedral, whether you're the king or the serf, and you all got the Eucharist. As okay. a, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but you go in this cathedral, there are these stained glass windows. What is on them? The actual story of Israel, Jesus, and all that kind of stuff. Wow. Right, and the light shines through 
It lights up the place. If you've been in these old cathedrals, yeah. they're actually strategically set. Yes. So like at the the time of worship, where the whole cathedral is centered, the worship time at noon is like peak to shine through the lights. Like they build weird way. If you go into old towns, the, the church is set at a weird angle and fucks up the whole downtown lines of right. roads because it's built <laughs> to do per- so per- that <laughs> when they hold the freaking Eucharist up, hmm. all of the windows are shining through and you're just like, Abraham and Sarah, all the Isaac, like all the right. way around, there, Jesus, Mary Magdalene is lighting up and this is going on right now. Wow. Now, this is beautiful. And if you only live in that cathedral, those stories have a type of, of permanence that they don't have if you can walk outside of it. Mm-hmm. Our contemporary culture in different yeah. parts of the West and stuff are people walking outside of it. And what happens when you walk outside? you realize that what was called the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac Mm. looks like some kid ate a pack of Crayolas and threw up on the wall because, because stained glass windows make no sense on the other side. You can't tell what the hell it is. And if you sit on the outside, you can then start explaining, Oh, here, this is where this came from. Right. Right? And so there is a sense in modernity, Mm. like you mentioned earlier, where if you're religious, there's two experiences. There's the awe, beauty, shock, seizing of being in that one place at that one time with everyone that shares that mythopoetic structure when the yeah. light shines through and the Eucharist is held up. And guess what? Even me does the prayer of confession. At least that's what my wife says. She's like, <laughs> it's amazing. You actually apologize every Sunday. <laughs> Right. But then you also have the you leave it. And guess what? You realize your neighbors weren't in there. Right. And then you look at the window and go, what the hell is that? That looks like a kid threw up with Crayola. Right. And then you're like, there's a mosque. And they also went in their thing and did their thing. Right. And you start doing this. And the what what enlightenment did was there's one type of engagement about religion, the seizing you type. Uh, the engagement mm. type of knowing you're mm. engaged knowing and then you walk out and you have the distancing knowing which you know in science right like to do science is to see everything in third person mm. right? okay a right. distance type of engagement right you anyway we don't have to go into trip as philosopher of <laughs> science but uh, it involves engaged epistemology type of knowing religion is a engaged type mm. of knowing And if you think your deconstructing demands you explain religion by disengagement, then you're in the same deficiency that a lot of people I spend lots of time with who are brilliant scholars come to me and go, well, you're not dumb. You understand the science. Is there a way to do engagement without your weird supernatural weird beliefs? Hmm. Because the idea that God doesn't like gay people and made the world in six days or that's stupid. Right, and I'm right. like, it is stupid. I never believed it, but nonetheless. Right. So I feel like there's this cross pressure hmm. right now. There's multiple religious traditions. Everyone yeah. knows what it's like to be in a cathedral yep. and want to be in there and love it. And if right. you're deconstructing, you also had those moments where you're like, the most beautiful moment was right now. Yeah, totally. I've had those. And then you know what it's like to sit on the outside, like the friend of yours. It's like, I can't believe you did that. Why yeah, right. did I have to sit through that worship service to get free pizza right. and play laser tag? <laughs> right. Right. So what if the process of deconstruction isn't a invitation to tear apart and then build back up? What if it's cultivating a way to understand how to receive what happens in the cathedral and how to receive what happens outside of it? Mm. What if it's about how we recognize that there are two different ways of knowing Mm. ways of engagement and ways of distancing and science. I guarantee you like, and I, I, my job is spending time with scientists as a philosopher and thinking about it is if you think if you're too invested in your science, they think you suck. 
And it's true. Mm. Like you aren't going to get it because what are you going to do? All your prejudices and all that kind of stuff come. You need to be more distant. You mean more rational. You mean more, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. But if you're religious and then you walk in and then you're asking about faith, what if you like Jesus is like, um, turn the other cheek. Uh, Jesus, I would like to reflect rationally <laughs> about what you're saying. Uh, Love your right. enemy. Now, if right. we were thinking about our enemy under what conditions, right? You know, like, right. You, right. And, but he's not asking you like how you process all of this. What he's asking you is if when you show up hmm. in the world, will top down coercive power be the best description of what beauty and truth is determined by, hmm. right? So love your enemy, pray for those that persecute you, turn the other cheek, walk the extra mile. All that is an invitation to a different description of what? Engagement. Because religion is about engagement. It's about a form of life. It's about a way of being in the world. And we're in an age where everyone doesn't have the same cathedral. Right. So we experience the inside and the outside. If you were told the truth of the inside requires that you go on the outside and then pull like a evidence that demands a verdict. Right. Right. And you're like, well, in fact, uh, second Isaiah in Isaiah 53 was predicting this fulfillment by, you know, like, right. And go through all that stuff. But why are you doing all this? Why are you freaking out? Like, have you just looked at this window? It makes no sense on the outside. Right. And, and, Hmm. And then it, it like, but you're like, no, it does. Cause it's ultimate truth. And as opposed to, it's not supposed to, in fact, you don't even get this truth. If you don't say Jesus is Lord. Hmm. And now that could sound like a weird postmodern dodge, except for the fact <laughs> that Jesus literally says to his disciples, who do they say I am? Right. And what do they say? Maybe you're Elijah. He didn't fucking die. Right. Sorry, I cursed again. Uh, he okay. came back down. <laughs> John, the, you maybe you're John the Baptist. God screwed your head back on. Right. <laughs> uh, you're related in one gospel, you know. Yeah, right, right. Um, right. Like, you know, in all those examples, or even the historical Jesus people, like uh, if you were in the Jesus seminar, you're a wandering cynic sage and, you know, and you, Construct it that way, or if you're like Gaze of Ramesh, a Jewish scholar that like puts him in the, uh, the the Jewish healers of the second time and understands him in that conversation, or mm. anti right, like looks at how like Second Temple period apocalyptic Judaism could reframe yeah. how he understands the vocation of Israel and the right. vocation of Jesus, right? Right. All those historians could go like that's plausible. Like maybe you're Elijah, maybe you're John the Baptist, maybe you're these historical constructions. Right. All of those suck. If you were asking about the faith question, because Jesus then goes, well, who do you say I am? Mm. It's a shift, not of truth, right? Who do they say? Those are all viable conclusions in the gospel based mm. on what Jesus said and did. The question is how you respond to it. And Jesus says, who do you say I am? Mm. And then Peter says, you are the Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus says, does what well, what he doesn't say is, well, the evidence demanded that verdict. Congrats, Pete. <laughs> right? He goes, My heavenly father revealed that to you. Hmm. And if you pay attention to that text, I find it to be a beautiful invitation for those of us who can't say everybody everywhere under the light of the sun has to agree. Mm. with our encounter of existence right. filtered through the stained glass windows in a cathedral and a community that resonate and hums and seeks to embody the love of God and Christ Jesus. Like you can't demand that in the light of the sun in general, but you can say that when you engage and invest yourself mm. in that light, in that mm. community, that what you're resonating with is a particular situated form of life you can't know apart from that investment and engagement. And that's why Jesus says, my heavenly father revealed that to you. It's not demanded by reason. 
it's discovered by existential engagement. Mm. You give yourself to this. Yeah. And so many people I encounter, and I, I know you're encountering people in this current moment of deconstruction, but when right. I started the podcast 13 and a half years ago <laughs> and uh, was doing it, like so many people had that experience of going, mm. what do we do? What do we do? Yeah, right. And, and so often I want to go, you can't go back in time where right. everyone's in the same cathedral. Right. But Jesus thought, that in a community where you're existentially engaged, right? Like where you are living in a community that wants to embody the way yeah. of Jesus in the world, right. that that's the actual place you understand who he is and who he isn't. Right. Publicly accessible, objective accounts don't work. Right. Not because they aren't important. Historians are important. Biblical scholarship is important. Science, philosophy, all that kind of stuff. Right. But just the truth of religion involves engagement. Hmm. It doesn't involve disassociation and distancing. And I'm worried back when I started the po my podcast, Homebrew Christianity, and was going through it with people then, and again now when it's shown back up, that people feel like deconstruction involves disinvestment. And I'm worried that when you put truth connected to disengagement as a type of knowing, not like a type right. of living, but like right. when disengagement's connected, then you've cut yourself off from the very thing a lot of, you know, secular post-religious people are interested in talking to me about just as a philosopher of religion right. who are getting at it from a different way, who are like, right, 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 we right. have no cathedral and yet I want one. Right. So what do you do with that? Right. And they'll no, talk the to money. me because I don't say God hates gay people. God right. hates science. Everyone that doesn't agree with me goes to hell. All those things that like right. some evangelicals are obsessed with. Obs like not if some, you never most. thought those, you know, <laughs> well, no, I mean, now that well, half of them are not, half of them are QAnon adjacent. I don't know what to do. With oh that, my, but. Listen, don't open up that can of worms right now. Okay. Cause we are an hour and 22 minutes into this podcast by far my longest, which I appreciate. Because I think what you're saying is, it's just needed, okay? Like, these are needed things. And um, one of the things I think is important here is that, well, here, here, here's what I'm struggling. Because I have one more question for you. And I, it's a big one. That's kind of the problem. Because <laughs> I, something you mentioned in your book that you, you it's on the cover is a study in open and relational theology. This idea of open and relational theology. And one of the things I've realized about that is it sounds like to me, when I first heard that term, I'm like, oh, is this like an open theism kind of perspective, which has also in my circles been labeled problematic. And I've heard you in other podcasts talk about how, and please, you have to explain this, and then this will be our last question for, for this episode, but <laughs> good luck explaining it. But um, from what I've heard you say, it's the idea that like, that like, the future is still unfolding, almost like God doesn't fully know what's going to happen. But to me, in my sensibilities, that's like problematic. But where am I off on that? Okay, so open relational theology in. Uh, all right, so about the openness part. You mentioned okay. the Lord Liar Lunatic bit. Yeah, that's a that's like a C.S. Lewis, yeah. you know, high quality move. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which, okay, I always feel bad because I wrote a book <laughs> that was like I came up with the title for search engine optimization purposes, hoping that I would sell more books by like giving C.S. Lewis a hard time, and and I I I like C.S. Lewis and right. I, if he's not, and he's like right. way cooler than most evangelicals. Like, and honestly, he's like, he's probably a universalist and he's friends with J.R.L. Tolkien. And right. I'm like a giant Tolkien head. Like, right. Like I have been trying to come up with a way to, con to convince the school to let me teach a Tolkien class and count it as a philosophy and religion class. So like I, I, I smoke a pipe and read Tolkien on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So like I, and I say that just because 
I know I'm about to make another joke <laughs> about C.S. Lewis. All right, I'm ready. And I know that a lot of people, and me too, when I was in middle school, I read all of C.S. Lewis books because my dad were like, you can read these, you're in middle school now. And I read them all and I was great. And like, you want to know, uh, the Lord Liar Lunatic thing kind of irritated me, but sure. the one that really got me upset was this, was the timelessness of God bit. Now, what I'm about to say is definitely a minority opinion for Christians. So okay. if you hate it, just say trip sucks. Like <laughs> most Christians don't believe this. I, I, I don't think it's a minority opinion anymore in the academy, but you know, but we also hang out with atheists all the time. So it might right. be right. Like we're backsliding. Okay. Yeah. So when it goes to time, the open part, there's kind of, here's these two images. One is the book. I was about to grab a book, realizing this is a podcast, but we're on video. Um, I got a book for you right here. Okay, there you go. Okay, so the book, this is C.S. Lewis image, is that history is like a book. Right. So God, definitionally, for C.S. Lewis and others, is out of time. And it's necessary for God's divine perfection for a lot of reasons. Right, and right. You're more than welcome to ask follow-ups, but I'm going to dodge them, given <laughs> I've had long answers to four questions. Uh, the, but the book for him is to say like, when we're experiencing time, like you and I think like, oh, I had no idea this conversation was going to go. And then the, sadly, I liked you before we started recording, which means I get excited. Take your facial expressions as encouragement and keep talking. Definitely. Yeah. So you haven't talked enough. And so (laughs) the, uh, so for, for God, God's like, bride of the world and decided to create i created i'm sovereign and shit right and now all of history is there like a book and by the end it goes exactly how i wanted right Right. so plan even even if you are in it you're experiencing the world kind of like if you were just you know moving the cursor over each line yeah right like you're experiencing the movement of the line but it was already written right Right. So uh, you get to, let's say, Jeremiah 18 and God talks to the prophet and it's like, hey, could you holler at Israel for me? Right. And right. This is a this is more of like the message version. Right. Um, you holler at Israel, like tell them, like, look, they're entrusting me and shit. Like, I'm tired of this idolatry. Like, I've already said, like, if you just if you just listen. Could you also could you stop taxing homeless people on the Sabbath at least? That's ridiculous. Like, you know, like and the prophet said, could you just like respond to it? And in fact, if you do, if you say yes to me, God hollering through the prophet Jeremiah here, right? Um, I will rework this junk. You know how like a potter sits there with a the pot? Sometimes right. the clay's not like ah, and then like, oh, <laughs> I'll rework this. Right, and right. then ooh, the clay's cooperating with a hand. It's beautiful, but sometimes that clay just acts a fool. Right, you know, maybe you were brought out of Egypt because you were enslaved, brought you to the Promised Land, gave you the freaking Torah, and now you're looking at me saying, "But what about one hill with a Baal service on it?" Well, Baal is fake, oh right? My like God. you know, and and then he's like, and then the prophet's like, Jeremiah's like. Well, what if you don't cooperate? Well, you just I told you the the, the potter's just like, screw this. This, right. this clay sucks. Right. Give me some new clay. Right. Now that whole story is told because Jeremiah is going, if you do this, God's gonna do this. If you don't do this, God's gonna do this. God wants you to be responsive, like the clay. Can you cooperate? Right. Can we co-create a beautiful piece of art together? Right. If you freaking suck, God can't do anything because God can't control you and make you do this. Mm. That is Jeremiah 18. Mm. Now, that sounds like God did not write the book in advance, and the cursor going over it is not over a pre-described text unless God's lying to the prophet and performing. Mm. Now, you say that, but conveniently, (laughs) a lot of theologians said that's exactly what's happening. They say, don't believe the Bible. Right. Don't trust the prophet. God sounds like 
things are open. Mm. And how we respond to God determines how God shows up in the next moment. But in fact, because God's obviously per perfect, like Greek philosophy that doesn't really, right. they also were anti-Semitic. Don't like <laughs> how they thought perfection looks. Uh, so obviously it, it's, it, it sounds like God's open, but really, and this is Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, all of them. Uh, my first paper that like ever got like award in undergrad was <laughs> yeah. on this passage. Okay. And that what, what's the example they all give? They say, Hey, Tim, I know it sounds like God changes God's mind based on how God works and is open and invested in one particular option and once the other one. But if this happens, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, no, that's called baby talk. You know how you have like your baby. Uh. You don't like look at your baby and go, have you considered the ontological <laughs> possibility of finitude structuring your meaning make? You don't say that to the baby because they're just like, <laughs> like you bend right. down and you goo goo gagoo at them. Right. So when you read the Bible, half of it, namely the parts that disagree with my theology, right, are baby gobble. And in, you can tell when it's actually true hmm. metaphysically. Okay. When it agrees with my commitments about what divine perfection is. So anytime it says God changes and the future's open, it's not real. It's just baby gobble. And and so the open deist interesting and the process deist and any of the open and relational schools of thought. There's a bunch of them. Moltmann. Uh anyway, there's a lot of different versions of it. But open relational is like a big an umbrella with lots of schools, but underneath it, they all go. Hmm. No, like the Bible's not lying that God actually is figuring things out with us. Hmm. And so then you ask, then what does it mean for God to be sovereign if God didn't right. write the book in advance? Of course. And there I use a flashlight imagery that the infinite God of love is the one who is with us, beside us, and before us with the flashlight. And because God is infinite God of love, God says, even if you go to Sheol, you cannot escape the love of God in Christ Jesus, that there's mm. nowhere you can go. So what is our, the, the sovereignty of God is that the God of love has refused to be God without us and goes wherever we go. And wherever we go, the light of God's love, fidelity, the Hesed love of God, if you're uh, into Hebrew scriptures, is it God's like holding our hand, shining it forward. Right. So God right. knows all that can be known, the past completely, the present as it's becoming, the future of possible as possibilities. And God will show up in every moment beside us and with us and before us as the one holding the flashlight of mm. faithful, canonic, invested love. And mm. now both of them have, in a sense, a way of affirming the sovereignty of God's love. But what the open side does is say that we actually genuinely contribute in our huh. co-creation of each moment and, and in our freedom with the story of creation. Right. And you, you say like, why would God ever want to do that? And I just say, I don't know. Why would God ever create a covenant with Abraham and Sarah? Like right. the whole freaking Bible is built on the con like, right, right. like the, even the creation stories, God outsources by day three. It's right. like, let us create, right? Right. <laughs> like, let yeah, the ground point. bring forth. The whole biblical story involves co-creation. And because of Greek desires of divine perfection, yeah. Then filtered through how we read the Bible, we had crappy ones. And then C.S. Lewis learned them and came up with really beautiful ways of defending them. But he doesn't have to. He can pay more attention to his friend. J.R.R. Tolkien, who in Lord <laughs> of the Rings yeah. gives a, a, a vision of you catastrophe right. where um, it's, it's precisely by the, the openings of divine sovereignty in the midst of friendship faithful to the end that beauty is brought out of sheer defeat, clinch, 
it is a dwarf becoming friends with an elf it is sam yeah. being pulled in and brought into the story it's it's in those relationships of friendship that the be like the, the possibilities get brought in. anyways like okay i have a preferential option for the tolkien i i love this this is amazing i'm i'm gonna end our conversation for this round i would love to if you have time have you back on in the future because you're you're great i love what you have to say it's thought-provoking it has it's given me a lot to think about and i think for a lot of us lay people us homeschoolers you know we have i have a lot to listen back on and to digest what you're talking about in a good way because it's very thought-provoking and it's very in a lot of ways it's actually very comforting and nurturing to know that like yes like we can think about for us in our context, these things in really an ancient way, which is for us a very new way, um, and really get a new sense of life and and um, just sense of like, yes, like, like the relationship, the experience, the us doing this together, the communal aspect that our Western culture makes almost no room for is beautiful and like should be pursued. And that is being countercultural, not wearing WWJD on your hand or voting for Trump, you know, like this, the counterculture is how are we, how are we being better humans and loving our neighbor better together in a community that, that reflects the love of God, which I think is just, mm -hmm. it's so well, it's so well put. So um, I appreciate you really coming on. I, I want to know for our audience, where can people find you? I know people are going to want to Google you and, and search you and listen to you. You know, where's your podcast? Are you on social media? Give me all that stuff. Uh, we'll just go to tripfuller.com with two P's. Okay. Um, my movie, the road to Edmund is on, you can now stream it on Amazon prime. It was sadly kicked out of every faith film festival that we applied to, but shown in a number of shown in a number of LGBTQ film festivals. Um, and uh, it is mediocre with a lot of funny jokes for people with religious baggage. Um, like, but if you just type my name in on Amazon, other stuff shows up. Um, but the uh, uh, can I ask you one question though? Yeah, sure. Because I I feel like I like you, but that's just because you made nice faces while I said things. Okay. Which you know, it's not hard. Like I, if you say if you just like look receptive while <laughs> yeah. I'm saying stuff, it encourages me to talk longer and not listen to you. So, um, <laughs> uh, so he, what is the question? that you had or, or maybe the moment you had the question that you knew you couldn't shake so you were like i'm gonna start a podcast because at least then i get to ask questions to people because at least my experience in having done homebrewed for since 2008 is yeah the liberating part aren't always the answers it's that there are other people asking the same questions yep and like once you give yourself permission to say like i am a person of faith and i don't know yes whatever that first question is so like yeah. like how what was that like a uh, uh, coming out story with your question that you decided like no this one's a public one i'm gonna ask it i'm going to take it and like if if you care about me then you just have to be honest like i have to be honest about what I'm carrying and it involves a question mark and not a period or an exclamation point. Well, um, yeah, thanks for asking that question. You know, I, I've been on my, I'm 32. That's all I am. Just so you know, for context, I, I've, I've been asking these, not so much theological, maybe existential questions, but I've been asking the question of church. What is church uh -huh. for, for uh, over 12 years now with people? I've had a long life of really great community. That's why I'm so passionate mm -hmm. about it. Um, I think though, for our purposes, you know, one of the, one of the big questions, one of the big ones that maybe got me saying, okay, I have to, I have to start the new evangelicals. Cause this is only about five months old. I started this in December. Uh, it's really grown. You know, we have uh, 13,000 followers on Instagram and the, the podcast has really taken off. And I, I think one of the big ones uh, for me was like, I mean, hell's of course is a big one, but for me, it was like, it was really the political elite, idolatry allegiance question yeah. for me of like watching the pe people who raised me, who are good people, who taught me 
hey tim se- your, your your sexual ethic matters right like you don't abuse yeah. women you don't look at pornography then vote for a guy who's in the cover of playboy and, and vote for a guy who's on the record saying he wants to grab women right to me that was the beginning of like okay something in my faith trajectory and what and how i'm reading this faith thing uh-huh. is totally at odds with like this evangelical american heritage that i've been steeped in and we have to start asking real questions of like how do we how do we read the sermon on the mount and then think that voting for trump or even even that that whole i would say very um fundamentalist ethos of like this is the only way to do it not even there's no space here right like how are we how how am i reading this and how are we getting that and that was probably the biggest question that launched me into like, I know I'm not the only one. I've had these conversations privately. I've had them on my Facebook. And I think I just got to launch this thing and, and just go for it. So is there a, like, in the middle of all that wrestling and questioning and that kind of stuff is, like, what, is there an anchor moment or two where you go, I'm not dropping this whole thing because of this, right? Like what, what's the, um, it, and I'm asking this because I, I remember those early on, which mm. I like at this point, like those aren't necessary, but like, because of your, like the closeness to the frustration, the questions and stuff that animate it and things like, what are those reference points maybe before the question arose where whatever was getting itself done in it is worth continuing to wrestle because something happened there, even if it had this like blanket of ugly. Totally. That is like worth doing the work for. Like is what's the beauty part that you can't let behind? It's this idea that, that it's this Jesus character right? Mm-hmm. Like there's something about this Jesus person thing, force, whatever. I don't know all the labels yet, right? Like I've had to unpack so many yeah. of those, but there's something a- about this Jesus character that we read that is for me at this point in my life, so inviting humanity to, like you said, co-partner with God to make yeah. the world better. Like that is gorgeous right like isn't that what we want and i think that's been such an anchor point along with seeing that fleshed out by having really i'm using such evangelical buzzwords here but really authentic genuine friendships with people where you see the divine in these moments that were like never planned right like i've had Mm -hmm. great listen i'm a drummer right i'm in professional spaces with worship i've had great moments on the platform i've had great moments with the haze and the lights no doubt but that's not like we're we're like the the reality of the divine i've seen the most right it's in these like late night up to two o'clock in the morning conversations where you're just pouring your heart out to these people. And you're like, okay, there's something so spiritual, so enchanted happening in this moment that I have no scientific lens for, but something in my gut is like, this is it. This is a a glimpse of a redeemed world is like this intimacy. And Mm -hmm. so I, I think for me, those two anchor points right of like this Jesus being this new humanity and wanting to be a part of that. And, you know, the kingdom going outward, not inward, right? First to the Jew, Mm -hmm. then to the Gentile. It's the opposite of fundamentalism. It's not narrower, it's wider and more broad. That's beautiful. And so how can, and so, you know, for me, it's like, how can I use that and help push the uh, Christian faith in America forward instead of bringing it backward? Because right now I feel like we're so degressing, right? Like we're just so backwards. How do I push it forward? Oh, I think that's beautiful. Like, and and I (laughs) don't, And you, when when I saw the like your title like the new evangelicals <laughs> yeah like that's one of those phrases where I'm like either that's like a lot of kahunas or like or <laughs> um, I I don't want to name people but there's like a number of social media people that somehow I got tagged in and then like I discover these like niches of social media of like evangelicals that think they've really progressed in really cool ways and are moving beyond stuff and it's like yeah we ordained a woman deacon you know (laughs) or like i have a black friend 
yeah like, and now totally. we go and break, like oh, that right. kind of stuff you know right and 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 so i'm like new evangelicals what's up with that mm. and but the and you tell me if i'm reading it right like because yeah. i just listened to a few episodes and then stalked your social media <laughs> but um like one of the things that made me real excited after you were like oh do you want to talk and then i went looking going like oh I feel like there's going to be family members that are still evangelicals. If I'm attached to anything, they're just going to email me. But the reason I was like, oh, I want to do this is because one of the things about new evangelicals recognizing where the questions and challenges come from is so many of our peers and those younger than us that are like piecing out or, you know, click the it's complicated. Yeah, totally, totally. Right? are because of like i mean just to be honest like in the u.s like shit like a bunch of white evangelicals were like i mean i didn't personally storm the capital but you know and they're like uh, all those kind of like adjacent to like the ugliest things that then yeah. half of the family is just like what you 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 you're, you you what right, right. and the other's like right. obviously i support liberty freedom and Jesus. <laughs> Right. right like and whatever that <laughs> moment is right yeah. right uh and having like been kicked out and there wasn't a like solid evangelical space where i could exist before right. even though i honestly i'm still to read the bible and go to and pray before bed every day person right like, I did it with two kids already before I talked to you. Right. I do it personally after we talk before I go to bed. It's 11 50 for me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But the new evangelicals to me is so exciting because I would love a place where my piety, where I couldn't talk about who I am without telling the story of Jesus. Mm. And I'm a super nerd who's like intensely committed to a world where my grandchildren thrive. Yes. Yes. because our ecosystem has been acknowledged right and the right. poor are are affirmed and mind-blowing stuff <laughs> yeah, but all that's just because a homeless jew is the image of the invisible god right right like, right that's the thing i don't i when you say new evangelicals like i don't know uh, i guess i stalked you just enough to think you might think that the gospel is actually so good yeah don't let them steal that shit exactly right. i'm trying to reclaim it dude i'm like no yeah. you cannot have it because can i interrupt really quick that's no, what i want you to people I want ask you to convince me that in 10 years i could be an evangelical again because right now <laughs> i people, i want to just endorse you that's why well trip uh, it, it you're like the list means a lot of <laughs> <laughs> listen but not here, your, your parents are not war criminals so well that's that, always good. yeah and my, my <laughs> anyway uh, uh, anyway here's the thing you're absolutely right i have this heritage of evangelicalism i've seen the good all right i've experienced the good i know the pastors that no one knows who have no scandal who have you know honored their congregation their whole life who have been you know quote unquote good and faithful servants i get that but the the pop the, the 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 popular evangelical movement is shit, and it's full of abuse, and it's full of like power problems, and it's full of white nationalism. And the early evangelicals were actually very quote unquote woke before this this fundamentalist resurgence, right? And I'm like, oh, well, yeah. I'm like, well, fuck that. We have to get back to this shit. Like, we have to get back to actually taking loving your neighbor seriously and literally and stop convincing ourselves that by going to a consumer-driven event that I sit and just spectate and check off a box that I worship, I've loved my neighbor while, my, while the poor are hungry outside. Like, that yeah. shit's got to change. And so that is, like, part of why I don't – and to be honest, I don't even know where this passion comes from. Some – gut part of me that I have no lens for or no re reason for, right? But I'm so fired up about this because I know that there are millions of us who are like, I don't, I'm, I'm because I'm more committed to Jesus because I listen to the scholars, because I'm balls deep in Tim Mackey and NT Wright and Pete Enns and Trip Fuller, yeah. because of that, I, I, I am not going to let this, uh, this 
whatever it is, this takeover happen because mm-hmm. there's so much good that can be done. The, the, the evangelical church is the largest. It's the richest. Imagine if we give that money away and love our neighbors like directly, right? The, the, the potential is there, even though it's very tough. And at times, in fact, mostly very discouraging work. I mean, I'm sure you follow some of the SBC stuff with Al Moore recently. It's like, what the hell is going on? So I'm mm-hmm. with you, man, all the way. I really am. That I know that's that that's so encouraging because I feel like like when you talk about that if you set aside some of the bullshit, like you don't know how to also you can't set aside the fire, right? That animates you. Right. And and I don't know if it communicates well, but like that's what I I've been working on that image of trying to describe like how you do the cathedral in and out because um and this is like statistical data like if you are a human who has a cathedral right and this is not telling you anything about what's on the wall right mm-hmm. like what what stories are shining through it could be any of them right be the Tao, the quran <laughs> right Cor- torah it could be all romans doesn't right. matter right but if you are in a community of people who get the hum and the vibe of being with people that are animated by a story that says the light of existence should be properly filtered for our engagement through a story that animates us. Yeah. Then you actually like sad for progressives give more freely to help others. Hmm. You are more likely right to uh, sacrifice for the well being of others you will have a higher life expectancy. Like you, it's better to live in a cathedral regularly than to quit smoking and exercise. Like mm. statistically, it's it. And and I'm not saying this like obviously. Therefore, there's a God and you should believe in Jesus. <laughs> I'm right. saying right. part of what it means to be human. Yeah, yeah. That element, that deep reservoir. I was trying to say like humans yeah. have this, and our modern worlds cut it off. Totally. Like, and then as Christians, we go that deep reservoir, it that the, the deep reservoir shows up in the homeless first century Jew who yeah. told us to love our enemies, to pray for those that persecute us. To, like you, you go through that and you're like, what if? Yeah. What if when we look at a, this present time and our challenges, right? And you said, what is the good news? Right. What right. if those windows? that the light of reality were filtered through or ones that said, yeah, black lives matter because the incarnation was a homeless first century Jew and persecuted and executed on a cross, accursed by God and yet resurrected Lord. Right. Shit. Right. You can't, you can't top that. You might come up with something almost as good, but you can't handle that. Right. 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 Yes. Like, and you're sitting there and you're on sitting at an ecological crisis and you're asking yourselves, how can we convince that 20% of our globe consuming 90% of the resources and and moving us into an eco side that they should, I don't know, take the form of a servant, humble themselves. Like, oh, are you talking about Philippians 2? Right. Where Paul says, let us have the same mind, be in you that is in Christ. Like, you're saying, oh, that's possible? Right. So my thing is like, right. if we can have new evangelicals, they're so obsessed with the gospel, and you never want to go in that cathedral if you also want Trumpism at the same time, if you also want white supremacy, if you also want culture dominance, if you also want Christianity that's connected to Christendom and imperialism, if you get those out just so we can have a smaller group of people where the story of Jesus filters into that deep reservoir so that we can have communities of action, care, and support and justice. Yes. Then I just want to say like, get rid of three fourths of the church. I don't give a shit because you know, what's compelling It's the gospel. That's why we're new evangelicals. Now I like science a lot. So it's real hard for me to want to use that term, but yeah, like that's why I just want to give you a hearty endorsement. And that's why (laughs) when I was stalking you, I was like, I like this Tim guy. I haven't (laughs) met him yet, but like to me, that's in listening 
and watching the stuff you're doing like i'm excited about that that there's a like what if there's a movement in evangelicalism that doesn't want to set aside the animating piety yeah but then wants to say in fact the questions and challenges we face as a species on this planet right are ones that gospel has good news for right and is it Shit. not good news? <laughs> it is. Right. That's why I'm saying, like, he is risen indeed. Fools, let's yeah. get up on this. Fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, yeah. A trip. Your endorsement means a ton. Um, you know, uh, here's the thing. I my wife has made dinner an hour ago, so I have to eat. Oh, sorry. No, don't feel sorry because I live for this shit. Okay, I make no money doing this. I can be here all day talking this stuff. I'm an uneducated two years of college fool, and and to be able to have you on the podcast to to drop your just your wisdom and your 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 knowledge and experience and your wording is is great. And I hope that in the future I can get you back on again to go for part two because man, I oh, just yeah. I, I just feel like there's so much good happening and people need to know that yes there's hope you can you can you can reimagine a more fuller gospel and not be you know outside the faith like you might think you are there it's safe mm -hmm. and i think that's just so important so i really appreciate you coming on thank you oh i loved it and and tell your wife uh <laughs> that i i love her as well <laughs> and i appreciate her patience <laughs> and um i hope you all have a great day and um, I hope the after dinner, you say, I have the baby. Yeah. <laughs> so they holler for you. Yes. The only you can give. <laughs> um, but do let me know when the episode comes out so I can share. Oh, well, oh, well, you do. Please, by all means, keep in touch. I will, you know, I know you're busy, but my doors are always open to talk more. So, oh, no, no. like my, uh, my evangelical background is so big. Like, I would love the opportunity to walk back into it. Cool. As a minister, it's real hard for them if they Google me to ever <laughs> let me back. You know what I mean? Yeah, I get it. The gatekeepers are strong right now. I understand. So yeah, if you make a movie where you roll a joint with part of Leviticus that says God hates gay people, it really it makes, it makes applying for jobs hard. I could imagine. So yeah. thanks again, Trip. I appreciate it. All right. Have fun. Thanks, man. All right. Peace.